Hi everyone, and welcome to our Outlander End of Summer series. We've put together four all new exciting events airing on Sundays. You'll hear from our favorite author, Diana Gabaldon, some of our incredible cast, our composer, Barry McCrary, as well as other fun special guests. This is all part of our effort to support Doctors Without Borders, which has been working tirelessly to respond to the COVID-19 emergency relief around the world. So if you enjoy what you see today and throughout this series, please click the link on this page to donate. Since none of this would be possible without Diana, this week I'll be talking to her about the evolution of her books, asking her some fan questions, as well as revealing an exclusive clip from an Outlander Untold scene from the season five Blu-ray and DVD at the end. So make sure to stick around and check it out. Now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Diana Gabaldon. Hi, Diana, how are you? Oh, so far so good, sling notwithstanding. <laughs> yes, I see it's still on. So, I mean, are you able to type with both hands yet? Yes, I am, thank God. Yeah, it's much more relaxing. I was uh, thinking the other day of the first time Ron and I came to visit you after we sold Outlander to Stars. I was thinking how nervous I was because obviously I was such a big fan of the books and I had so many questions I remember coming into your house and as soon as I stepped into your actual house, all questions went out of my head. Like, you know, I had so many questions and then it just was like, we sat down and it was just blank. What are your first impressions when Ron and I walked in the door? I was very excited and very nervous too, because you know, you just don't know what you're gonna see. I think we kind of took you through what we were thinking in terms of the story. And, and I think we asked you if you had any kind of concerns for what we were about to do, or obviously we talked yeah, about <laughs> prior, prior iterations of, of this story, because there have been many. <laughs> For the author of a book, you know exactly what these people look like. You know what they're doing. You know what it should look like. You have this, this picture in your mind. And naturally, what's on the script is not going to look like that. I mean, they can't. And so, you know, I was entirely prepared for that. But other people's versions are often kind of startling. And, uh, and yours wasn't. You know, you and Ron actually did grasp who the characters were and to a large extent what they would and would not do. Consequently, you know, even when changes have to be made for a television script, you made them very thoughtfully and considerately. You tried to preserve the actual flow of the story and the characters' natures, which I really appreciated, having seen a lot of alternate versions. I can imagine. Well, I think people, I feel like people ask you all the time if when you're writing now, you see Sam and Katrina, and I know you say no, but even though Sam and Katrina and the rest have done such an amazing job, that they're still probably not what you imagine in your head. No, no, they're not. You know, when I'm writing, I'm in the world of the book, which is a completely different place from the outside world or the show world for that matter. I think the first season was magic for all of us because, you know, you only can see a couple fall in love once. That's right. The first time. It's not like they don't kind of find new things to love about each other, but there's only going to be a first lead up to them being intimate with each other once. You're never going to capture that specific moment again, so there's something special about that. That's right. But That's right. as the books have gone on, obviously, as you know, we've diverged from the books here and there. You keep telling me you can how this will end. Murtaugh and keeping him alive, probably the one of the bigger ones. You know, a lot of people ask us if we come to you with those kind of things. And certainly on the Murtaugh of it all, we did call you mm -hmm. and say, hey, we have an idea. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. And it is well known that you were not crazy about it. I mean, you were like, go with it. But is not my first choice, obviously. For us, we felt we needed someone to continue for Jamie to talk to besides Claire. I mean, Claire's always gonna be his first person, but also we were looking for that second person to balance things off of because unlike the books, we can't hear inner monologues. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Unless we do voiceover, which is something we do sometimes. We don't like to rely too much on it. That plus the need to condense things because there's a big sprawling books and there's no way you're gonna fit even part of them into a one season show. But that's the, the main main difference between uh, book version and show version. And have you ever retrofit anything? So have you ever kind of gotten to a later book and gone, oh, I did something I that didn't work and now I'm going to retrofit it? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, yeah, as my husband uh, once said, you can't tell if anybody in your books is really dead unless you saw them go gack right in front of you. <laughs> Now, have you started book 10 at all? I know you're revision book nine, but do you write little, since you write out of order, do you have little bits of 10 uh, sitting around in the house? Yes, I do. Yeah. No, uh, when stuff bubbles up, I write it down because you know, when I've seen something, you know, then that's gold you know, and I can start with something. So in fact, I have little pieces of all kinds of books, including the prequel, which is about uh, Jamie's parents, Brian and Ella. Yeah. 
and also about uh, Master Raymond's first book, which, uh, you know, pieces of him bubble up just periodically. And, but yeah, there's always pieces, uh, especially in the mid part of a book that I'm working on, when I know stuff is going to happen down the line, and I'm writing it, but I don't exactly know where this book ends and the next one begins. So those pieces, sometimes they shift back and forth. And sometimes I'll have quite a large chunk written, and I'll think, you know, this just doesn't fit in here. It must go in the next book. It's nice that I still have some place to put it. <laughs> So getting back to the show, a lot of people ask, you know, we obviously a couple years ago released the chemistry test between Katrina and Sam. What's the matter? Don't sulk for God's sake. Oh, sulk. Sulking, is it? I'm using all the self-control I've got to stop from shaking you until your ears rattle. That was fabulous. I was thinking, wow, that really works. And, you know, I could tell from the comments, you know, from the onlookers that everybody else there felt the same way. It's funny because we had that test in Los Angeles at Sony and um, they have a small casting room. And I remember when Katrina came in, because I think Sam was there first, that they kind of instantly got along. <laughs> yeah, it felt like they'd known each other for years. I think when I, you grabbed my hand and I like punched you in the face, I was like, right. <laughs> that was good. Such a relief to all of us, I think. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. So you've gotten to know the cast as we've gone along. What would you say is your relationship with all the cast members? And do you talk to them frequently? Do they come to you for insight into characters? I know obviously I talk to the writers quite a bit, but. Yeah, and I've gotten very friendly with Colin McFarland, who plays Ulysses just on Twitter more recently. Mistress. Sarah. Ulysses. So he did come and talk to me before his first season started and was asking interesting questions about Ulysses and his relationship with Joe Casta. It's mostly been Sam and Katrina that I have more of a personal relationship with, you might say. Sam, for instance, will usually check in with me around the beginning of each season and kind of say, well, you know, where is Jamie's head right now? You know, what? what's eating him at the moment, you know, what is he trying to do? And, and you know, I'll just kind of do a brain dump oh, at this point in his career, you know, this has happened and this is how he's reacting to it. And, you know, then he can use whatever of that is useful to him. And now what, I mean, I'll share my favorite uh, moments from series, but what would you say are for you, your personal favorite moments from your books? Like if you had two favorite moments and that's hard, I know it's like picking who, which of your kids is your favorite, but I mean, when you look at your books overall, are there a couple moments you're like, Ugh, I, I just, this touches my heart for some reason, or? Yeah, well, there's always, you know, a number of scenes from each book that are like that, because if those weren't there, it would not be a good book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to, to say. But, you know, for Outlander, for instance, one of my favorite scenes is the one when Claire arrives at Castle Leoc and starts tending Jamie, because that's that needs to be done. She's the only person that can do it. They have this physical intimacy more or less forced on them because she's having to fix him and so forth. And this immediately develops into unexpected emotional intimacy for, for them both. Yeah. There's too many, um, honestly, moments in the show that for me uh, to pick a favorite. I've told this story before, but I, I think just a special moment for me was during the first season when we went up to our Craig Nadun location. We were filming Claire going through the stones for the first time. And it called for a gust of wind to come up when she's picking the flowers and going over. And, and we didn't have a wind machine that day, but every single time we did that scene, the wind would come up. It was just kind of spooky and magical. And it just kind of felt like, oh, we're in the right place at the right time. It was like a special moment. Well, it was a special moment, a special for me, because that is the, the actually the first footage that I saw of the show. Oh, really? Yeah, Ron and I were doing one of the early fan events in New York, and we were backstage waiting to come on. He had a laptop with him, and he said, we got some of the first dailies in. Would you like to see them? And I went, yes. So he showed me, and it was that, and then on her shawl when she's lying on the ground. Well, I'm sure you've been asked this before, but obviously, um, last couple of seasons, you've written an episode. Mm -hmm. Matt called you about writing an episode for season five, Journey Cake, which I love that title. It's just- Oh, thanks. Do you find it difficult to transition from writing just your novels to going and writing a 50 page script? Or is it just really easy at that point? Cause it's just such a small chunk. Writing a script is way easier than writing a novel. I mean, obviously it's shorter and so forth. The only thing is that you have so many, it's a very collaborative yes. uh, exercise, <laughs> completely different from writing a novel. You just uh, you put in the pieces and you make sure that you have a, a nice dynamic uh, flow and that your structure is, is good, that the, the story flows and you 
not just get the beads in and so forth. You know, there's underlying structure, which is very important in any kind of dramatic thing, from a short story to a novel to a TV episode. And so we have that, you know, for instance, we have the triple strand of plot running through Journey Cake, and we have the recurrent peanut butter theme. Well, I thought before dinner, we could have the future's answer to Journey Cake, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Is Dougie the only one who reads your books visually? Yeah, I don't write them, as I say, in order. So what I have are scenes. When I've finished a scene, I will print it off. I work in the middle of the night, he gets up at dawn. So, you know, I'll come down around 4.30 and leave it on his sink and he'll get up at 5.30 or 6 and uh, take it with him when he goes out for his coffee. If he has time, he'll read through it and make marginal notes and uh, bring it back to me at lunch and you know, talk, talk to me about it. Or sometimes he just says, oh, this is great and wonderful and tell me what he likes, which is of course marvelous. But it's also good if he says, you know, there's this, this thing in the middle here, you know, I don't really think that works, you know, and this is why, you know, this character would not do that. He's always right, you know, when he says that. And in fact, sometimes I'll give him a scene and at the top, I'll say there's something wrong with this, but I don't know what it is. And he'll tell me, he'll pick and make, he has a very good literary eye. But he's the only one who sees it. Do you and Doug ever argue about a character? Like he'll say, you know what, I don't think so-and-so this would do that. And you're like, actually, I think that person would. Yeah, well, it's, it's never an argument because, you know, I, he has a really good grasp of these characters. He's been living with them for as long, almost yeah. as long as I have. Um, but, you know, when he says something like that, I will say, well, I see what you mean, but, you know, it's right. because there's going to be another scene prior to this in which this happens. And that's why he's now going to respond to this in the way that he does rather than in the way that you would think he would if you hadn't read that scene. So sometimes I'll come back and say, no, I, I, no, he just wouldn't do that. And in that case, I'll listen to him. I find that fascinating. Let me just say for the record, I love Doug. He is one of the sweetest, nicest people. I always look forward to seeing him at conventions or wherever we might be. So, um, We've now pulled up some fan questions and we're going to pose these questions to both Diana and uh, I will chime in as well. First question we have is, uh, did Brie shoot Bonnet out of pity or revenge, or both? Inquiring minds want to know, she didn't say anything, although it is kind of nice to leave it to your imagination. Still curious, though. We did purposely leave it ambiguous. We did not want to answer that question. We felt that the audience should make up its mind. I will say just from my personal perspective, and this is not talking for the writers, for me, it felt like a little bit of both. It wasn't really so much revenge. I don't think Brianna's character, in my mind, is a revengeful sort, really. She wouldn't want to see anyone suffer. and She knew that Bonnet's worst fear was drowning, and quite honestly, that's a horrible way to go. So I feel like it was pity, and I think she just wanted it to be over, quite honestly. Well, I value ambiguity. I, I really like uh, I like that. And it's uh, it's easier to do in a, in a novel, but, uh, but you did a good job with it in the show. As for Brianna, what she did was mercy. She had mercy on him because she knew exactly how dreadful that would be for him. And he's going to die either way, regardless. There's also the sense of finality of drawing a line under Stephen Bonnet. As she says in the book, I'm the only person for whom this isn't murder. Her father and Roger both volunteered to kill him on the spot if she wanted that done, or to support her if she wanted to kill him on the spot. And she didn't. She wanted him to be tried and have legal process and so forth. But when it came down to it, you know, she would give him that gift and send him on his way quickly. What is your favorite costume of the season? This is a hard one, as people know or don't know. The first four seasons, we had the marvelous Terry Dres back as our costume designer, and she left us after season four after establishing this amazing look. Um, and Trisha Bigger is our new costume designer starting on season five. I think everyone looked so amazing. It's hard for me to um, pick one costume, although, um, well, I did love seeing Jamie in the kilt again, but I, I think Jamie has this kind of, and I'm not going to do it justice in describing it, but it's this kind of overcoat that he has that looks so amazing. And then something else that I just loved was the last scene with Claire on the porch from episode 12. She has this great blue sweater on that's just to me exactly in this horrible moment, the aftermath, wrapping herself in this yeah. unbelievably cozy looking blue sweater. It was just marvelous. I don't know, Diana, if you had a favorite look or looks. Oh, a number of them, yeah. I really love Jamie's uh, look when he was setting off to rescue Claire and he has this sort of high collared military jacket on with his kilt and so forth. But let me put in a word here for the Browns of Brownsville, whose costume I thought was fabulous. 
Those guys are just terrific actors. They're so repellent. <laughs> They're so terrible. Yes, uh, good costuming is supposed to do help them be in their characters and do what they what they needed to do. The next one: Will we see any more exclusive collector's edition scenes for season five, like we had in season four? Yes, we will. We have four Outlander Untold scenes that will be revealed later and will be available on the DVD Blu-ray set. Yeah, I've seen them all, and they're great. <laughs> I'll enjoy them. I mean, the charging buffalo scene, how did the special effects people throw Brie, Sophie in the air and how did she participate? <laughs> Obviously it was a stunt woman, not Sophie, but we actually, in a funny moment, had one of our crew members dressed up as the buffalo. That was um, great. I and, not, <laughs> and not for the moment where she's thrown, which we either used a rig or a trampoline for the stunt person, but when she's kind of shooing the buffalo and trying to get it to come towards her, there's a hilarious outtake of one of our crew members dressed as a buffalo. <laughs> I think Sophie just did such an amazing job. Yeah, she did. <laughs> she's so in the scene and it's, I don't know how she did not bust up laughing. <laughs> Next question. In my case, the question is for the first episode of the first season. I am re-watching it. Good for you. How was Jamie at the front of Claire's window in Inverness before she went through the stones? Oh, Diana, this is one of those circular, yeah, circular um, um, time <laughs> paradoxes that maybe you can answer that I can't. Well, you uh, notice that we see that uh, figure of Jamie there when Frank comes in to Claire and tells her that he thinks he's seen a ghost. And I turned around to say something, and he gone. He just vanished. He did see a ghost. It's Jamie's ghost. That's, that's why he's there. You know. Now, why he's there and how he got there is a question that will be answered, but it will be the last thing in the last book. Right. Who came up with the idea of that beautiful song, Never My Love? The answer to that is Tony Graffi, our amazing, wonderful, talented writer. And actually, I think Matt's assistant, Maddie, also had this on her list to us that was such a fitting song for Jamie and Claire and certainly in this moment for Claire to be playing in her mind over and over and thinking of Jamie and, and that warmth and protection and kind of where her home was. Are we ever going to find out what was life was like for young Ian with Indians? I could tell you but then we would spoil things. I mean future books that is talked about. Well you will actually get to see a little bit more of that in book nine. Oh, oh interesting. And the last question, um, what can Diana tell, about, tell us about the next book in the series? Uh, well, I could tell you a whole lot about it, but we don't have that much time. What you really want to know is when is the book coming out, and that I, I don't know. Um, I'm very close to finishing writing it. As to what it is, it's a really, really interesting book. I've been having such fun with this, especially now that I'm in the final phases where I actually really know everything that's left. I can't say that there's no tragedy in it, but you know, by and large. Oh. Uh, let's put it this Oh God, way. is it someone we love? Mm. <gasps> Actually, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's put it this way. Uh, it's not Jamie. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that, that leaves so many people though. Somebody a few months ago asked me, you know, uh, can you say something in five words or less that will make people, you know, want to, uh, want to read uh, book nine? And I said, yes. He's still alive because that's what they're afraid of is that Jamie's going to die in this book. And I don't think I'm amiss in, in telling you that he doesn't. You know? Oh, but so you didn't, but, that. but you didn't say Claire survives. No, I didn't. Yeah. But, um, you know, we'll have to see. I, I feel nervous all of a sudden, like I'm sweaty. <laughs> Diana, I hear a rumor that potentially a little sneak peek of your next book might be in the DVD collector's edition. Yes, uh -huh. we did this for the season four DVD as well. So this one deals with an encounter in the Highlands that involves uh, Jamie, Claire, uh, young Ian, and uh, several other people, as a matter of fact. Wow, interesting. Uh, well, thank you, Diana. It was so lovely to talk to you. Oh, my pleasure entirely. And before everyone goes, uh, we're going to have a sneak peek of of one of our first Outlander Untolds with Ulysses and Murtaugh, which Diana has already seen, have you not? I have, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, well, we hope everyone else enjoys it as well. Thank you.
Thank you again to Diana for being a part of this series and to all the fans for tuning in. We'd also like to thank Doctors Without Borders for providing vital support around the world during COVID-19. If you've enjoyed what you've seen so far, please help us by clicking the link on this page to donate. And please tune in next Sunday for more of our end of summer series with our favorite Outlander cook, Teresa Carl Sanders, who will be joined by actors Lauren Lyle and John Bell. See you next week. Coucou les addicts, c'est Aurélie du site Outlander Addict et j'ai un message pour vous. Si cette vidéo vous a plu, n'hésitez pas à vous abonner à la chaîne, à mettre un like ou à partager cette vidéo sur vos réseaux en cliquant sur le bouton partager qui se trouve juste en dessous. Pour prolonger votre expérience, je vous encourage à visiter régulièrement mon site internet outlander-addict.com. Vous y retrouverez des traductions, des articles et plein d'infos et d'actualités sur Outlander. A très bientôt.